I deliver mail. And I was out on my route delivering mail, and here are the supervisors, two of them whipped up in front of me, and my dad in was in bad shape. He's on oxygen. And uh, I thought, oh, something happened to my dad. And so they come running over to my car, and I said, is it my dad? And they said, N they shook their head no. And I said, is it one of my kids? And they went like that, and I said, is it my son? My son was a senior at the uh, Univer University of Pittsburgh, and uh, a girl that lived on the second floor, her ex-boyfriend uh, set a fire, and uh, the smoke, you know, killed my son while he was upstairs sleeping. This uh, boy, more or less, was, uh, I don't know if he was stalking her or what, but, you know, jealous or whatever, and, uh, you know, set the fire and intended to kill her. And, uh, you know, Joey didn't make it, you know. We buried him on Monday, I think it was Thursday, was uh, when the detective called me to tell me that it had been an arson, and he wanted to let the family know before it hit the news while well, I was by myself when he told me. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't imagine the trials would start and stuff. and. The first time I took my daughter was when the trial was actually going to start. And ever since that day that she's seen this Matthew, I've had to sleep with her. And that was back in July. Chrissy and I was watching TV the other day, and they said how one act, stupid act, can affect so many lives. And she looked at me, and she said, we really know that, Mom, don't we? But you figure this boy was jealous or whatever about this girl living with this guy, or I don't understand what he was thinking of, but his stupid act has ruined lives of people he didn't even know existed. We've never done anything to her. I've never gotten a traffic ticket, nothing. And to be punished like this, for the, and we'll be punished the rest of our lives because of someone we didn't even know. If he would have been in an accident with a where he was drinking, or if he would have um, had been a car accident where it was an accident or something, but to know that someone deliberately, while he was sleeping, but where is the safest place you think your child is? In bed sleeping. He's, he, what this kid did is he has no idea how he has affected all of us. I mean, just the emptiness, the sick feeling that you have inside you every single day. Not a day goes by that I don't, do not shed a tear. Not one day. I'd gone through a couple of years of problems. Um, um, uh, my wife found a boyfriend and moved away to uh, Cleveland. And then my, my mother started getting sick. So I came home to take care of her. And uh, we were together for about eight months, and then she passed away. And I had just got a job with a real estate company where I was going to do their maintenance for them. And I was in an alley behind their property, uh, bringing a key back. Somebody followed me back to the property. Well, these are all fun-loving people, you know, and I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was a joke. Somebody pulled in behind me and got out and uh, approached me with the fact that um, he thought I was somebody else. He thought I was somebody that had uh, stolen a uh, stained glass window from his one of his properties. And I just happened to be working across the street from one of his properties. And uh, I thought it was a joke. I really did. And uh, so I, I really didn't put up any resistance. And then he, he slid out a, a metal baseball bat. And he started to attack me. I was obviously the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. But I 
backed up. He took out my knee. I went down. He just started beating me like crazy. I never even defended myself, which is the, the hard part, because all my life I've defended my family, my friends. I've worked as a, a doorman at local restaurants and clubs. And I always had confidence in myself to take care of myself and my friends and my family. And uh, when he took me out like that, it was, it, it changed my life. I'm very angry. And uh, I mean, uh, from time to time, I'll burst into these screaming fits in my own house. You think I'm talking to myself. I ain't talking to myself. I'm just mad. It's tough when you can't physically do what you want to do. I can't climb ladders. I have no knee. Um, my muscles and tendons are crushed. And it's going to take four or five years to maybe build up the strength in my knee that I could even climb a ladder. I've been going through a lot of depression. I sit on my couch and cry, and I live like a a spider. I mean, I keep my blinds closed. I, I'm scared to death to answer the phone or, or answer the door. And uh, that ain't right. I'm six, I'm almost 6'3". I weigh 225 pounds. And yet, I'm scared to walk from my house to my car. You know what aggravates me the most is I was just at the point where I was ready to rebuild my life. I look to the future and I see things, but it's, I'm not impatient, but I really want to get back to where I was. My house was broken into um, while we were at work. And I, it was when I, but I actually had called, kept calling my house because my husband gets home before I do and I was going to be inviting him over to my parents for dinner and that's where I was at. And he picks up the phone and immediately and says, the house has been broken into, you need to come home. They kicked in my back door and they had taken our 36-inch TV that was in the living room. They took our 25-inch TV that was in our bedroom. They took just a lot of weird stuff that we kind of don't understand why they would take it, but like towels out of our, our closet. They took like wash rags. There just seemed like there were so many little things that just kept coming up missing every day that went on. I'd find something else. They took my camcorder, which had my, my youngest son's newborn video in it, which that's probably the worst thing. They could care less what's on that video. They're not gonna watch it. They probably just threw it away. But that's, that's my, you know, that was my baby, my newborn baby on there that I, I'm never gonna get that back. A detective like tried to get fingerprints on, on like the computer because they, they had messed with that and he couldn't, we've never heard anything back. I just wanted my things back, you know? I mean, granted, they came into my house and I don't think it would have been the greatest to get it all back, you know, or to find it. I still would have been, that. I think that would have probably been traumatizing too, is knowing that they had them and then they got them back, you know, it's like, what have they done with them? We ended up getting a security system, but there's still times when like if I come home by myself and I have the kids and it's dark, our garage is detached from the house and, and it's like I just want to grab the kids and run and I make sure that my oldest son doesn't leave the garage until I'm, I've got the baby out and I'm just, I just almost want to run, hurry up and lock the door, run, shut the door. I mean, I don't even set anything down until I've shut the door and locked it. And I mean, that's not a good feeling and I do that Anytime I'm by myself, I'm, I'm always really scared. You do, you feel violated. It's just like it's like they've been in your home. They've been through your things and I just, it's not a good feeling. 
and that's something, you know, yeah, they're there for 20 minutes to wreck your life for, you know, your sense of security for a year. It seems like such a, a, a small thing to, you know, to get burglarized and that it wouldn't be that big of an impact or it wouldn't really affect you since you weren't there, you weren't physically being harmed, but it is, I mean, it just, mentally, it, it messes with you <laughs> and just not feeling safe in your own home is not good, not a good feeling at all. It happened when I was between, I can't remember the exact age, but it was between five and seven. Um, but I never told anyone until I was uh, a senior in high school, 17. The one that I was abused by was my, at the time, my best friend's older brother. He was about seven, we were the same age, he was about seven years older than us. Um, it all started off with the hugging game. He would take us into his room, her and I individually, and just we would sit on his lap and, and he would hug us. And to any child, that feels really good. It was a fun game, you know? But he was very weird about it. He said we couldn't, we couldn't even talk to each other about it. We couldn't, her and I couldn't talk to each other about it. Every time she would leave the room, he would jump on me. He never... I was never penetrated vaginally, it was always oral. Um, mostly he would lay on top of me. I couldn't even breathe. He would say stupid things like, well, why didn't you say something? How could I? When I told my mom, I remember we were in my room and I just kind of broke down. I started crying and I ran, I ran out of my room and ran downstairs and it was like, I didn't want to tell you this, I didn't. She's going, what don't you want to tell me? And finally, I just laid it all out there for her, and she, she was very, I mean, she was upset, she was hurt, uh, and I didn't tell her who it was. I didn't tell her for about a year or so who it was. It took a while for me to tell her. She got me into therapy right away. It was never a question of, are you sure this happened, you know? Are you sure you're not making this up or you're just remembering things wrong? She never doubted me. And to this day, I wish I had said something to her years before, but I couldn't. I was depressed for a long time. I didn't even realize I was so depressed for a long time. All I ever did was sit in my room and watch television and eat. I have a hard time trusting people or I just jump in like feet first without them giving me any reason to really trust them. Usually I find I've gotten burned like that a lot of times, but it's like because I did I feel as though as when I was that young I wanted to be able to do that with someone and I couldn't. So now I'm still kind of looking for that. When I walk into a room Within 10 minutes of being in that room, I know every way out of that room, including if I had to jump out of a window. And it's just, it's like instinct to me now. I don't even realize that I do it anymore. But just, I'm always looking for an out. I'm never trying to be trapped in the corner. Never again. I recognize now that it's not about sex at all. It's all about power. And uh, I've, I really do fear that a lot of them get off on that. Um, the whole idea of you hurt me, you know, you're hurting people. I think that's what, that's what they're looking for. It's weird for me to talk about this because it's so third person, because I do feel as though she's still with me. She's still in there. That little girl is still, you know, she cries sometimes still, and it's like, it's okay. It's okay to cry. I mean, I'm still angry. I think I have every right to be angry, but it doesn't, it doesn't rule my life anymore.
It was uh, part of my childhood to be beaten so badly that my eyes would be swollen shut for days on end. I had an uncle who was, um, he was a sadist. He was um, brutal. He was, um, he was absolutely insane. And I suffered um, beatings at his hands time and time and time again. Um, he would be the only father figure that I would know as a child because my mother and him lived together all throughout the earliest part of my childhood. Um, my mother was, a, as well, she was a violent person. Um, any, any small thing that uh, annoyed her, it was taken out on as kids. My mother handed me over to a pedophile when I was five, and by then, I, um, you would have thought that I was conditioned to handle um, the horrors of my life. But this added a new dimension to my suffering, and uh, I found it almost unbearable to deal with. Um, so at, as a kindergartner, I would have to leave uh, kindergartner class and go home and have uh, sex with this man who was in his 50s. I remember the long walk home and crying and falling down and having to get back up and walking on and falling down and crying and getting back up and walking on. I had to adjust to that situation. I had no choice but to shoulder this responsibility. And I learned that um, food um, meant sex for me. Young in life, I would turn to drugs, and that would be a friend of mine for a long, long, long time. My journey has been an enormous struggle for me. I've known years and years of depression. I've, um, I've, uh, I've been physically sick in times in my life. I lost my job. I had no friends. I, I assumed I would die. I never expected to live through the, uh, th live through this. I don't think being uh, abused as a child goes away. Um, there's things that I do deal with as an adult now that uh, um, it's kind of like problem troubleshooting. I, I maintain. Uh, taking care of my mental health and my emotional health, and I've learned over the years to be fairly good at it. I, I, I know that I am a high-functioning abuse survivor. I have a propensity towards honesty, whereas my siblings don't. They, they want to just forget it. They don't want to think about it. Um, but I think it's more insidious than that. We were made to witness crimes committed against one another over and over again. It's like we're, we're, we hold the truth and we can't get near one another. It's too horrible. To even see each other is so painful. When I was 16 years old, a senior in high school, um, my girlfriend and I were coming home from snow skiing. And she had just taken her eyes off the road for a minute. And we hit a truck. And my neck was crushed. And it left me paralyzed from the neck down. After I had recovered from my injury and kind of built back some self-esteem and confidence, I was a senior in college and had a boyfriend. Shortly after we became engaged, I heard him refer to me as his pretty bird in a cage. And I think it just sent chills down my spine when I heard that. I always had to come home from class on time and tell him where I was going and when I would be back. And when I came in from class, I was a few minutes late. And when I came in the door, he was sitting on the couch and he had a butcher knife in his hand. He grabbed me by my feet and pulled me out of the wheelchair. He climbed on top of me and held my arms down with his knees. And he started choking me and stabbing the butcher knife around my head. At that point in time, 
I realized my life was in danger and I didn't want to stay in this relationship. But it was just three weeks later um, that he had pretty much held me hostage throughout the night and I was admitted into the hospital with a broken arm, broken nose, broken ribs, and my sternum was permanently damaged. Then at that point, it took the hospital, the police, the university, and my family all stepped in and got me out of that relationship. And it was about a year later when the trial was starting for the first charge. And I went into that courtroom with the utmost confidence that the person that did this to me would be punished for what he did. It was a five-day trial. On the witness stand, his attorney portrayed me as a woman with a severe disability that no other man would ever want or ever love, and how wonderful his client was for giving up his life to take care of me. And in a jury of 12, my batterer was found not guilty. That was completely devastating for me. I felt re-victimized, only this time by the system. What was so difficult for me is I knew there were other people that went through experiences of domestic violence, but I felt like I was alone as a person with a disability going through that. And there were so many layers of issues with my disability that contributed to the abuse, made it more difficult to get away and to recover from. I had moved to California after the abusive relationship, and I was out there, and I had just completed my master's degree in social work. And this was six years later, in 96. And it was one Friday evening, about eight o'clock. I was sitting on the living room floor and I had my bedroom window open, not unlike all the other apartments in my complex. And I heard a noise in my bedroom. I called for my caregiver to come to see what the noise was. And the next thing I saw was she was walking out of my bedroom backwards. And there was a man that had a gun to her head. And behind him was another man with a knife. Then the man with the gun went to the sliding glass door, opened the door, and in walked two more men. So there were now four men in my apartment. And they pulled all of the phone cords and all of the lights out. And uh, they burglarized my home, and I was raped, and repeatedly told that they were going to kill me. I know that the reason I was chosen is because of my vulnerabilities with my disability. I could not run from them. I could not fight back. I hardly even have the strength in my voice to be able to yell. I'm an easy victim, an easy target. Those four men were never caught. I see all of the additional stigma in our society for people with disabilities. I see how they are being targeted for crime and abuse. And for me, I felt like those experiences happened to me, and I don't want to just bury them and not do anything with those experiences. And people with disabilities is a huge population, and I think it's important for everyone to realize that people with disabilities want to be treated fairly and equally in our society like everyone else. And we want to have the same services and the same respect as everyone else in our society. I'm a victim of domestic violence, and I think the thing that was the hardest to realize was that I really was a victim. My ex-husband was very controlling. 
um, very um, isolating from friends, family, church. Uh, he monitored my coming and going. He didn't let me talk on the phone. You know, my family was stupid and I was stupid and the things that, you know, the apartment that I lived in that he moved into with me, um, it was stupid. You know, everything wasn't up to his par, um, including me. And um, so, you know, I was constantly in a race with myself to see, you know, what I could do to make it better or fix it. And it, it just kind of snowballed from there. And um, the crux was when he threatened to have me killed. You could put on your, your social face when you were outside, but um, the thing that was most um, frightening was I was literally afraid to go home at the end of the day. Work was a comfortable setting. Church was a comfortable setting. Um, nobody was going to do anything. Um, but then you get in your car to go home and you start having panic attacks. The daily impact once he threatened to have me killed, um, it was like you were outside looking in because by the time that happened you know I wasn't really talking to my family because I had pretty much pushed them by the wayside they didn't like him or how he treated me because they could see it of course I was I was too involved in the relationship to see and um, so there was nobody to go to I kept thinking in the back of my mind that Domestic violence happened to somebody else, you know. On TV, it's it's some other person or some other um, background or lifestyle or um, age of a person. You know, it, I didn't think that it would be happening to me. You go through the whole realm of emotions. One minute you're mad as a hatter that you allowed yourself to do this or that he did it to you, um, and the next minute. You're so glad and relieved that you're out of it. He was sexually abusive. Um, and I think of all of it, that was probably the most painful and still probably the, the hardest to get past. Um, you know, when you're in a relationship with somebody that you love and they use sex forcefully, um, it's devastating, it's demoralizing. I've gotten to the point where I know I'm better off without him, and I'm moving forward. Me being a victim of domestic violence has really affected my whole entire family and friend structure. For the longest time, it was the elephant in the room. They tiptoed around all of the issues. The fear has eased a little, but it's still there. Um, it's still fresh enough. Um, Emotionally, I just, I can't imagine going out on a date again um, or getting into a relationship again. Um, I can't imagine being intimate. I'm afraid that if I put myself out there, it'll happen again. My daughter and I were going to the grocery store in the morning uh, in November of 1979, and she was five months old, and um, we were hit head-on by a drunk driver. It was his fourth time for drunk driving. He had no license. He had no insurance. He drank a pint of whiskey about uh, before 10 o'clock in the morning. My daughter was in a car seat and she, the straps just busted on it. And she came around and hit the back of her neck right here on the corner of the dashboard and crushed, um, you have the cervical section of your spinal cord and um, it goes C1 through C10 to right about here and she crushed C4, 5, and 6, these three vertebrae right here, and they uh, kind of twisted like this and went across and then ended back on top of her. 
spinal cord and she was paralyzed from the neck down. And I broke about 14 bones from the waist down and I have a couple of plates in my left foot and I have a rod in my right leg. You know, she always had pneumonias, and she had atelectasis, and she had bladder infections, and she had tracheostomies and other kinds of infections, and she had seizures. I had um, seven years of playing tug-of-war with God, and I knew that he'd win someday. She died, and that was in 1986. I try and have the good pictures in my head of Laura instead of the bad pictures now, but the bad pictures plagued me for a long time, and the hatred was just unbearable for the man that hit me. I mean, that was like just carrying an extra tumor, you know, a big tumor. And uh, so you've got the hate, you know, it's just this intense hate and you lay in bed at night and you know I used to concoct all kinds of plans on how I was going to kill this guy and then I thought I'm not going to kill him I'll, I'll hit him in the back of the neck with a lead pipe I'll have somebody hold him down I'm going to paralyze him like he did Laura and then you just go on with these scenarios and you just build this up so now you've got all this hatred for this person and you get all this pain and sorrow sometimes the people who do it even after they've been picked up for drunk driving they still don't see themselves as a problem, you know, because maybe somebody isn't in their face showing them a picture of their dead daughter or telling them what that felt like or how horrifying it was uh, to have her chew her fingertips off because she couldn't feel them and was covered with blood one morning, you know. Let's, and then and now let's start thinking about what if it was your kid? What if somebody did this to your kid? Let's start thinking about that a little bit, you know, or having your mom or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or whatever. You know, start thinking in those terms a little bit and, you know, maybe that'll, I don't know, help deter you. You want a drink? Drink. Take a cab. My son, Anthony Dyer, who was 16 years old, had um, gotten, had joined a gang that I didn't know about. And the gang that he was in, um, they murdered him. My son um, hadn't come home, and it was on my pay week, and um, he hadn't came home for two days. That Friday, uh, I was going to call the um, the, the television station and asked them to um, air my son on the TV, but um, that evening I heard about a body had been found and I didn't feel comfortable with that. I went down to look at the body and um, when I, what I saw, it didn't look like my son because it, um, his face was swollen, he was, um, he was frozen, it was, it was a bitter cold. Um, the only way that I really identified him was by uh, his fingernail biting. Um, and it, it, it was hard. It was very hard to deal with that. They end up beating him. Then they put him, wrapped him up and put him in a, um, um, a towel and put him in a trash can. So the leader of the gang told him to 69 him, which went, meant kill him. So one of the guys went down, down the hill and kicked him in his head until um, he wasn't breathing anymore. And he took his gym shoes off that I had just bought him. When they finally picked him up, the, um, the guy that had kicked him in his head, um, he had his shoes on. I didn't even know my son was in the game until after he passed. He was only 16. He was st to me, he was still a baby. I had a memory lost. Um, people that I had known for years, I couldn't remember who they were. Um, I couldn't go back to work for um, at least three weeks. Um, you know, people would question me about different things, and I didn't want to deal with it. I would uh, cry all the time. It's just your whole life, you know, you, you just it's just turned upside down. 
None of them showed any remorse. Next year, three of them will get out of their plea bargain. Um, some of them got seven years. Um, one of the girls um, that cleaned up the blood um, at, the, at the apartment that he had got beat up at, she's out. The leader of the gang got 15 to 30. Um, the one guy that had his gym shoes on, he got 12 years. No, he got 16 years. And the guy that took his clothes off and burned them, he got 12 years. So they all got time. If you've committed a crime and it's totally shut out and you're going on with your life, well, the, their family, they're not going on because their life is, is forever changed. It's, it will never, never be the same. And it hurts because I know my son wanted to live and it wasn't fair. It was not fair. My name is Ji Young An, and I am the sister of Dong Young An. It was a long and difficult decision to sit and write this statement. Bringing up the feeling of memory is still something I avoid doing. It was a Sunday, and I think he was playing basketball with um, our church youth group, Korean church youth group kids. Um, they went over to a local school um, court to play, and um, five or eight white teenagers came over. Um, he said he didn't know them. They asked, do you want to play five on five? And they were, they agreed, they started playing basketball. Um, it seemed like the white boys were um, purposely fouling, pushing them, shoveling, and that happens in basketball. So uh, my brother was the oldest among the kids who went with him. He said, uh, come on, you know, let's play. Let's just play a game. You know, why are you guys pushing? And they would keep on pushing, snicker about it together, you know. Um, so it came up to a point where it grew into an argument and my brother said, uh, I had enough, we're gonna go. And that's when they started kind of, who the F do you think you are? About five or eight more kids came, so they were in total about 16, 12 to 16 kids. Um, he heard from the back, there's that chink standing there alone. Let's jump on him now when he's alone. Um, my brother turned around and um, they circled him. And um, they're like, Chink, go back to your country. And um, we're not even from China. After they spit on his face, they knocked him to the ground. Four or five, maybe even more kids started to step, stomp, and kick his head, face, and back. He was lying on the ground. He did not fight back. All the facial cheekbone was all just cracked into pieces, nose bone fracture, and um, he lost sensation. There was a nerve damage, so he lost sensation on his four of his upper tooth and whole bottom um, of the part. He doesn't have sensation till now, and it's been about a year since that happened. The police report was that they wrote it up as if it was a gang fight that um, they were playing basketball, they got in an argument, it was a mutual fight. They thought it was a Chinese gang versus American white gang, and that offends me, just because of the description of how I look and how we are. The image of my brother falling on that concrete floor and people stepping and just kicking with shoes on his face, I couldn't get that image out of my um, head. What goes through one's mind when they kick and step on a living human being just covering his face and head to survive? What does one have to do to deserve all this? Getting into an argument playing basketball? I had a chance to read my victim impact statement at the court. I wanted to see the kids who did this to my brother. And I, after I read my statement, I said, um, just because someone speaks less English than you, just because someone looks a little different than you, and whether if it's the same, that doesn't give you any right to step, to kick or spit on someone's face. And um, the response I got from him was, I'm sorry I caused you such inconvenience. And, um, but if you think I'm a racist, I'm not, because I don't treat people by their color. 
hate crime, you know, it's not something explicit that you can see. You are just hitting or you are just punching someone due to your anger or your frustration. But the impact, the hurt that that person has, they carry on for life. And the people around that person who love him or her, they carry on the same pain. To see someone that you really love suffer and go through pain, that's not an easy thing to carry because it always stays in the back of your mind and it really hurts. Jill was on the second floor. The first floor apartment was empty, and the basement floor was in, inhabited by the man that killed her. He apparently had gotten the idea that um, Jill was narking on drug dealers in the area, and he had been dealing drugs out of the apartment. She had been there two months. She had no idea. He was waiting for her when she returned home from work at one o'clock in the morning. And he punched her in the face, stunning her, and got her tied up and spent six hours killing her, raping and killing her. Eight years later, it still seems like yesterday. They did not want any of us seeing her because she had been so badly beaten. Um, I was allowed to hug a body bag that was on the elevator at the funeral home. And I basically said the goodbyes for the entire family at that point. Jill's murder left me with this huge, gaping void in my gut. And I felt like if I ever let anybody close enough to see that, they'd either think that I'm crazy or they would be terrified by what I had to show them. I became really, really suicidal after Jill's death and wanted very badly to be with her. My oldest sister became pretty agoraphobic. Uh, it's still difficult for her eight years later to leave the house without a strong family member with her. Um, my brother, who had problems with alcohol prior, became full-blown alcoholic. Now I'm hypervigilant, so unless I know everything that's going on, I'm not comfortable. Uh, eight years later, I'm still sleeping with the door locked. I have insomnia now, stomach problems that make it impossible for me to eat out. It's like traveling grief. So it just keeps re-manifesting in different, different areas, but it's all the same pain and anger that are sitting in there. I got the, the uh, nickname Angry Amy when I was working at the salon, and I don't think I was showing any anger at all, you know. I'd, some of my reactions, you know, if this guy that's in prison for my sister's homicide, if he gets raped and killed, I don't care. And maybe that's what they were perceiving of, of anger. That's, I don't see it as being anger. I see it as being realistic. <laughs> I can't care about his life. He was found guilty of first degree murder. Uh, he was found guilty of rape. It was uh, death penalty plus 60. Um, the death penalty was then overturned on appeal to a life sentence. The biggest thing as far as, as offenders in homicide goes is the fact that there is not one, just one victim. You're not just stopping at that one person. They are destroying many, many lives. My quality of life will never be the same as it was. You know, my innocence is completely gone. There's very little that life can show me that is going to be as good as when Joel was alive.
my daughter was trying to stop an argument between two more girls, a friend of hers and the young lady that stabbed her. And she walked up to her and tried to, you know, protect and, well, how do you say, stop the fight? So it wouldn't start, rather. And the girl stabbed her in the neck. And it hit her a order, and she bled to death. Because you see, my daughter suffered from MS. She couldn't fight. She couldn't walk straight on a straight line. When I got to the hospital, they did tell me that she had a, a pulse. And of course, that made me feel better because I knew she was, you know, she had life. But then a doctor came out and told me she didn't make it. And that's when I kind of went to pieces, I guess you might say. I do know that there are a lot of people who commit these crimes and think that they should be, shouldn't be held responsible, but they should, and they should be punished because you can't go around taking people's lives and not be punished. I think the girl got, what, 10 years. She thought she should get out because she had a son at home who needed her. And I wanted to jump up and say something, but that big son of mine was with me, and he held me down because we wasn't supposed to talk, really. And um, I wanted to tell you, yes, my daughter had a mother at home that needed her, but she couldn't have her. If she ever comes to court again or tried to get out on parole again, I want to be there too. Because even though I know I won't get my daughter again, I miss her. If people just realize how it hurts the family of these people that they hurt, kill, and maybe they could understand, I wouldn't want that to happen to me, so I can't do it. But we have some people with no conscience, I guess. One year later that my son, I lost my youngest son. And that didn't help matters either. But God has been with me. And I'm doing the best I can. And I'm sure they wouldn't want me uh, crying every day or, you know, suffering because of them. I can hear them now, Mama, you got to go on, you got to live. So that's what I'm trying to do. I was carrying on doing routine housework and I had gone outside for a few minutes to check a dryer vent had come back in, left a door unlocked just for a matter of moments. And um, before I could go back to close that door, to lock that door, a man came in through that door, um, came up from behind me, threatened me, took me out to the woods behind my home um, where he robbed and raped me. I really feared that I'd never see my husband or children again. But he did let me go but with the words, you remember that I know where you live. And if you tell anyone, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna kill you. And in a small town like we live in, um, to relocate would have been, you know, of no use at all, especially my husband's a police officer. He'd been upstairs asleep during that time um, that the man came in, but he'd been up for over 30 hours. And I knew that if I screamed, then I was afraid that it would the end result would be not only my death, but his death as well. I'm the protector. I'm the, the, the husband, and I, I felt like I had failed. And as a police officer especially, uh, and here this happens not only in my own town, but in my own home. My husband called the police. I begged him not to. I, I knew that this man meant what he said, that if I had told anyone that he was going to come and kill me. Of course, I went into immediate shock. Um, I was like a zombie. It was like, this can't have really happened to me. You know, I've got to be dreaming and I just can't wake up. I couldn't sleep. When I did finally sleep, 
there were nightmares. Um, I couldn't eat, I couldn't think, I couldn't focus. The kids and I would be having dinner with Debbie in the evening and she would just explode seemingly for no reason and you know it would shock us and then we'd realize okay something was just said or there was some reference that that flashed her back and we had to learn how to accept that and deal with it. Anytime I was in a crowd I was looking wondering you know is he following me is he looking at my children when I would kiss my children goodbye in the morning I'd wonder are they going to come back through that door in the afternoon because I just that really and truly felt that if he couldn't get to me, that he especially would probably grab my daughter. A lot of people told me after I was attacked, Debbie, at least you're alive. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm not alive. I felt like I couldn't trust anybody, especially, of course, strangers. I never felt comfortable anywhere. I never felt safe anywhere. You never get over this. Um, I see um, an anger sometimes in my son whenever he hears about a woman this happening to another woman because he knows firsthand what it does to the entire family. It's not just the primary victim that's involved here, it's each and every person that touches her life. And my husband, of course, he felt guilty because here he felt like he was able to protect the whole city of Williamsburg, but yet he laid asleep while his own wife was taken out of her home in the middle of the day. So the guilt was phenomenal. There's multiple victims. I was a victim. Both of my kids suffered. Uh, my daughter was afraid to go out from the house to the car at night. Uh, my son. Uh, both of them were, were actually bullied at school over this because we did go public with it. It was six and a half years after um, the rape that he was found and he was found because he had um, robbed two other women. Virginia has a law where they will take the, uh, a sample from all convicted felons. They do a DNA typing on them, testing on them, put it in the data bank, the computer immediately does a cross check with other evidence that has been entered and because he was there for another robbery, he got caught. I want to be able to meet face to face with him. I guess in some ways it's like facing your fear. I want to look at him and I want to tell him, I'm not afraid of you anymore. I need to be able to look at him eye to eye and say, you can't hurt me anymore. It's over and it's done. And I need that for me. I was walking home from a dinner party. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, at night, walking down Pennsylvania Avenue in our nation's capital, and um, was accosted by three gentlemen that um, grabbed me and drug me behind a Dempsey dumpster and beat me and kicked me. Um, they knocked out my front tooth, bruised a couple of ribs, and um, all they really got out of the attack was um, $20. I literally gave them my billfold. They took 20 bucks out, that's what it was in there, um, threw it back at me, and they took off. I got up and I ran. I ran home for the uh, rest of the blocks. During that entire night, I didn't sleep, I didn't bathe. Um, I just remember laying in my bed, staring at the wall and the ceiling and thinking, God, I'm so thrilled to be at home and so thrilled to be alive. We called my parents after the police officer had left, and um, I had one friend on one phone and I was on another, and I just wanted to assure my mother that, um, that I was, first of all, okay, uh, that I was going to be okay, but I told her, and she was on one phone, my dad was on another, and so it was kind of hectic and crazy, and they were both very upset, and my mother was very emotional and crying, and, you know, you never want to hear uh, your parents uh, be
be that just so sad. You know, I had a great doctor. I had a great dentist. Uh, they worked with me, but financially it was very difficult. My parents were extremely helpful uh, in that situation. If not, um, I don't know what would have happened. I still think about it when I'm walking down the street, whether it's you know six o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night. Um, I really don't walk after nine. I know that sounds crazy, but um, I take cabs everywhere now. Long term, I just don't think that you ever, ever recover from it. It makes you so much aware and it makes you a little bit more jaded about um, people that you pass on the street. Um, you never know what's going to happen. There were three individuals that were captured that were uh, doing random acts of violence, roaming Capitol Hill. I think that they need to take responsibility for their actions. I think that um, certainly, um, so they can't do this to anyone else. Um, I think that monetary damages should be uh, a consideration also. Um, counseling, I mean, just all these different, all these different factors. But first of all, I'd really just want to know why. I don't understand what makes people that way.